Hello and welcome back to In Cold Blood Part 1. We'll be starting kind of in the middle, a little lower down from the middle on page 36. I have had a costume change because I thought it was warm outside, but now I'm a little cold because it's the evening. Just a little behind the scenes. I'm sure you guys were just dying for. Alrighty, we are going to be on um, the line that says, By mid-afternoon, the black Chevrolet. By mid-afternoon, the Black Chevrolet had reached Emporia, Kansas, a large town, almost a city, and a safe place, so the occupants of the car had decided to do a bit of shopping. They parked on a side street, then wandered about until a suitable crowd, crowded variety store presented itself. The first purchase was a pair of rubber gloves. Those were for Perry, who, unlike Dick, had neglected to bring old gloves of his own. They moved on to a counter displaying women's hosiery. After a spell of indecisive quibbling, Perry said, I'm for it. Dick was not. What about my eye? They're all too light colored to hide that. Miss, said Perry, attracting a sales girl's attention. You got any black stockings? When she told him no, he proposed that they try another school. School. Store. Black's foolproof. But Dick had made up his mind. Stockings of any shade were unnecessary, an encumbrance, a useless exp expense. I've already invested enough money in this operation, and after all, anyone they encountered would not live to bear witness. No witnesses, he reminded Perry, for what seemed to Perry like the millionth time. It rankled in him the way Perry mouthed those two, or the, the way Dick mouthed those two words, as though they solved every problem. It was stupid not to admit that there might be a witness they hadn't seen. The ineffable happens, they do take a turn, he said. But Dick, smiling boastfully, boyishly, did not agree. Get the bubbles out of your blood. Nothing can go wrong. No, because the plan was Dick's, and from the first footfall to the final silence, flawlessly devised. Next, they were interested in rope. Perry studied the stock, tested it. Having once served in the Merchant Marine, he understood rope and was clever with knots. He chose a white nylon cord, as strong as wire and not much thicker. They discussed how many yards of it they required. The question irritated Dick, for it was part of a greater quandary. He could not, despite the alleged perfection of his overall design, be certain of the answer. Eventually, he said, Christ, how the hell should I know? You damn well better. Dick tried. There's him, her, the kid, and the girl. And maybe the other two, but it's Saturday. They might have guests. Let's count on eight or even twelve. The only sure thing is every one of them has got to go. Seems like a lot of it to be so sure about. Ain't that what I promised you, honey? Plenty of hair on them, those walls? Perry shrugged. Then we better buy the whole roll. It was a hundred yards long, quite long enough for twelve. Kenyon had built the chest himself, so we're doing a perspective switch here. A mahogany hope chest lined with cedar, which he intended to give Beverly as a wedding present. Now working on it in the so-called den in the basement, he applied a last coat of varnish. The furniture of the den, a cement-floored room that ran the length of the house, consisted almost entirely of, exa of examples of his carpentry. Shelves, tables, stools, a ping-pong table, and Nancy's needlework, work, chin slip covers that rejuvenated a decrepit couch, curtains, pillows bearing legends, happy, and don't have to be crazy to live here, but it helps. Together, Kenyon and Nancy had made a paint-splattered attempt to deprive the basement room of its unremovable dourness, and neither was aware of failure. In fact, they both thought their den a triumph and a blessing. Nan Nancy, because it was a place where she could entertain the gang without disturbing her mother, and Kenyon, because he could be alone, free to bang, saw, mess with his inventions, the newest of which was an electric deep-dish frying pan. Adjoining the den was a furnace room which contained a tool littered table piled with some of his other works in progress, an amplifying unit, an elderly wind-up Victrola that he was restoring to service. I'm cold, I gotta go inside. Welcome to the dining room. I didn't pick these drapes, they came with the house, I'm gonna change them. Alrighty, so we are down uh, talking about Kenyon's and bit, um, inventions kind of on the, the bottom paragraph of page 38. Kenyon resembled neither his parents physically. His crew-cut hair was hemp-colored, and he was six feet tall and lanky, though hefty enough to have once rescued a pair of full-grown sheep by carrying them two miles through a blizzard, sturdy, strong, but cursed with a lanky boy's lack of muscular coordination. 
This defect, aggregated by an inability to function without glasses, prevented him from taking more than a token part in those sports teams, basketball and baseball, that were the main occupation of most boys, who might have been his friends. He had only one close friend, Bob Jones, the son of Taylor Jones, whose ranch was a mile west of the Clutter home. Out in rural Kansas, boys start driving cars very young. Kenyon was 11 when his father allowed him to buy, with money he had earned raising sheep, an old truck with a Model A engine. The Coyote Wagon, he and Bob called it. Not far from River Valley Farm, there is a mysterious stretch of countryside known as the Sand Hills. It is like a beach without an ocean, and at night, coyotes slink among the dunes, assembling in hordes to howl. On moonlit evenings, the boys would descend upon them, set them running, and try to outrace them in the wagon. They seldom did, for the scrawniest coyote can hit 50 miles an hour, whereas the wagon's top speed was 35. But it was a wild and beautiful kind of fun, the wagon skidding across the sand and fleeing coyotes framed against the moon. As Bob said, it sure made your heart hurry. Equally intoxicating and more profitable were the rabbit roundups the boy, two boys conducted. Kenyon was a good shot and his friend a better one, and between them they sometimes delivered half a hundred rabbits to the rabbit factory. A Garden City processing plant that paid ten cents a head for the animals, which were then quick frozen and shipped to mink growers. But what meant most to Kenyon and Bob, too, was their weekend. Overnight hunting hikes along the shores of the river, wandering, wrapping up in blankets, listening at sunrise for the noise of wings, moving toward the sound on tiptoe, and then, sweetest of all, swaggering homeward with a dozen duck dinners swinging from their belts. But lately things had changed between Kenyon and his friend. They had not quarreled. There had not, there had not been an overt falling out. Nothing had happened except Bob, who was 16, had started going with a girl, which meant that Kenyon, a year younger and still very much the adolescent bachelor, could no longer count on his companionship. Bob told him, when you're my age, you'll feel different. I used to think the same as you. Women, so what? But then you get to talking to some woman, and it's mighty nice. You'll see. Kenyon doubted it. He could not conceive of ever wanting to waste an hour on any girl that might be spent with guns, horses, tools, machinery, even a book. If Bob was unavailable, then he would rather be alone, for in temperament he was not in the least Mr. Clutter's son, but rather Bonnie's child, a sensitive and reticent boy. His contemporaries thought him stand office, offish, yet forgave him, saying, Oh, Kenyon, it's just that he lives in a world of his own. Leaving the varnish to dry, he went on to another chore, one that took him out of doors. He wanted to tidy up his mother's flower garden, a treasured patch of disheveled foliage that grew beneath her bedroom window. When he got there, he found one of the hired men loosening the earth with a spade, Paul Helm, the husband of the, of the housekeeper. Seen that car? Mr. Helm asked. Yes, Kenyon had seen the car in the driveway, a gray Buick, standing outside the entrance of his father's office. Thought you might know who it was. Not unless it's Mr. Johnson. Dad said he was expecting him. Mr. Helm, the late Mr. Helm, he died of a stroke the following March, was a somber man in his late 50s whose withdrawn manner veiled a nature keenly curious and watchful. He liked to know what was going on. Which Johnson? The insurance fellow. Mr. Helm grunted, your dad must be laying in a stack of it. That car's been here, I'd say, three hours. The chill of oncoming dust shivered through the air, and though the sky was still deep blue, lengthening shadows emanated from the garden's tall chrysanthemum stalks. Nancy's cat frolicked among them, catching its paws in the twine with which Kenyon and the old man were now tying plants. Suddenly Nancy herself came jogging across the fields aboard fat babe, babe returning from her Saturday treat, a bath in the river. Teddy, the dog, accompanied them, and all three were water splashed and shining. You'll catch cold, Mr. Helms said. Nancy laughed. She had never been ill, not once. Sliding off Babe, she sprawled on the grass at the edge of the garden and seized her cat, dangled him above her, and kissed his nose and whiskers. Kenyon was disgusted. Kissing animals on the mouth. He used to kiss Skeeter, she reminded him. Skeeter was a horse, a beautiful horse, a strawberry stallion that he had raised from a foal. How that Skeeter could take offense. Use a horse too hard, his father had cautioned him. One day you'll run the life out of Skeeter. And he had. While Skeeter was streaking down the road with his master astride him, his heart failed. He stumbled and was dead. It's a really bleak story to share. 
Now, a year later, Kenyon still mourned him, even though his father, taking pity on him, had promised him the pick of next spring's fall, foals. Kenyon, Nancy said, do you think Tracy will be able to talk by Thanksgiving? Tracy, not yet a year old, was her nephew, the son of Eviana, and the sister to whom she felt particularly close. Beverly was Kenyon's favorite. It would thrill me to pieces to hear him say Aunt Nancy or Uncle Kenyon. Wouldn't you like to hear him say that? I mean, don't you love being an uncle? Kenyon, good grief. Why can't you ever answer me? Because you're silly, he said, tossing her the, her, the head of a flower, a wilted dahlia, which she jammed into her hair. Mr. Helm picked up his spade. Crows clawed, sundown was near, but his home was not. The lane of Chinese elms had turned into a tunnel of darkening green, and he lived at the end of it half a mile away. Evening, he said, and started his journey. journey. But once he looked back, and that, he was to testify the next day, was the last I seen them. Nancy leading old babe off to the barn, like I said, nothing out of the ordinary. The black Chevrolet was again parked, this time in front of a Catholic hospital on the outskirts of Emporia. Under continued needling, that's your trouble. You think there's only one way, Dick's way. Dick had surrendered. While Perry waited in the car, he had gone in the hospital to try and bear, buy a pair of black stockings from a nun. This rather unorthodox method of obtaining them had been Perry's inspirations. Nuns, he argued, were certain to have a supply. The notion presented one drawback, of course. Nuns and anything pertaining to them were bad luck. He and Perry was mo and Perry was most, most respectful of his superstitions. Some others were the number 15, red hair, white flowers, priests crossing a road, snakes appearing in a dream. Still, it couldn't be helped. The compulsively superstitious person is often a serious believer in fate. That was the case with Perry. He was here and embarked on the present errand, not because he wished to be, but because fate had arranged the matter. He could prove it, though he had no intention of doing so or at least within Dick's hearing, for the proof would involve his confessing the true and secret motive behind his return to Kansas, a piece of parole violation he had decided upon for a reason quite unrelated to Dick's score or Dick's summoning le letter. So basically, Dick said, do you want to come do this murder with me? Um, and he sent it in a letter. The reason was that oh, several weeks earlier, he had learned that on Thursday, November 12th, another of his former cellmates was being released from Kansas State Penitentiary at Lansing, and more than anything in the world, he desired a reunion with his man, his man, his real and only friend, the brilliant Willie J. During the first of his three years in prison, Perry had observed Willie J from a distance, with interest, but with apprehension. If one wished to be thought a tough specimen, intimacy with Willie J seemed unwise. He was the chaplain's clerk, a slender Irishman with prematurely gray hair and gray melancholy eyes. His tenor voice was the glory of the prison's choir. Even Perry, though he was contemptuous of any exhibit, ex exhibition of piety, felt upset when he heard Willie J sing the Lord's Prayer. The hymns gave grave language, sung so credulous a spirit moved him made him wonder a little at the justice of his contempt. Eventually, prodded by a slightly alerted religious curiosity, he approached Willie J, and the chaplain's clerk, at once responsive, thought he divined in the cripple-legged bodybuilder, with the misty gaze and the prim, smoky voice, a poet, something rare and savable. An ambition to bring this boy to God engulfed him. His hopes of succeeding accelerated when one day Perry produced a pastel drawing he had made, a large, in no way technically naive, portrait of Jesus. Lansing's Protestant chaplain, the Reverend James, po Reverend James Post, so valued it that he hung it in his office, where it hangs still, a slick and pretty savior, with Willie J's full lips and grieving eyes. The picture was the climax of Perry's ne ver never very earnest spiritual quest, and ironically the termination of it. He had joined his Jesus a piece of hypocrisy, an attempt to fool and betray Willie J, for he was as unconvinced of God as ever. Yet, should he admit this and risk forfeiting the one friend who had ever truly understood him? Hod, Joe, Jesse, travelers straying through a world where his last names were sel where last names were seldom exchanged, these had been his buddies. Never anyone like Willie J, who was in Perry's opinion, way above average intelligence 
intellectually, perceptive as a well-trained psychologist. How was it possible that so gifted a man had wound up in Lansing? That was what amazed Perry. The answer, which he knew but rejected as an evasion of the deeper, the human question, was plain to simpler minds. The chaplain's clerk, then 38, was a thief, a small-scale robber who over a period of 20 years had served sentences in five different states. Maybe you don't get your spiritual advice from that person. Perry decided to speak out. He was sorry, but it was not for him. Heaven, hell, saints, divine mercy. And if Willie J's affection was founded on the prospect of Perry's someday joining him at the foot of the cross, then he was deceived and their friendship false, a counterfeit like the portrait. As usual, Willie J understood, disheartened but not disenchanted, for he persisted in courting Perry's soul into the day of its possessor's parole and departure, on the eve of which he wrote Perry a farewell letter, whose last paragraph ran, You are a man of extreme passion, a hungry man, not quite sure where his appetite lies, a deeply frustrated man, striving to project his individuality against a backdrop of rigid conformity. You exist in a half-world, suspended between two superstructures, one self-expression and the other self-destruction. You are strong, but there is a flaw in your strength, and unless you learn to control it, the flaw will prove stronger than your strength and defeat you. The flaw? Explosive emotional reaction out of all proportion to the occasion. Why? Why this unreasonable anger at the sight of others who are happy or content? This growing contempt for people and the desire to hurt them. All right, you think they're fools, you despise them because of their morals, their happiness as a source of your frustration and resentment. But these are dreadful enemies you carry within yourself, in time, destructive as bullets. Mercifully, a bullet kills its victim. This other bacteria, permitted to age, does not kill a man, but leaves in its wake the hulk of a creature torn and twisted. There is still fire within his being, but it is being kept alive by casting upon it. It's like, um, it's actually a word for like sticks or wood of scorn and hate. He may successfully accumulate, but he does not accumulate success for he is his own enemy and is kept from truly enjoying his achievements. We will stop there and we're going to talk about that paragraph in class for sure.